Hello everyone, I am Joe Flick with the Montana State Library and I am here with your state librarian, Jenny Staff, and a few other MSL staff who are on the agenda today um, with our website chat. I used to say monthly, it's not really monthly, it's more periodically, almost monthly, because we, we don't plan these events until we have something worthwhile to share. So um, don't want to waste your time, but we uh, we do record all of these, so anytime you aren't able to attend live, we look for the recording. Um, let me show you, we have a Vimeo channel, and uh, I post all the website chats to the same channel. You can always check in with any, any MSL staff, and we'll be happy to send you this link. Um, but we do, you might want to just uh, bookmark the showcase in Vimeo, where you find these, and that makes it easy to get back. Or you can always go to Aspen, Count the Aspen e calendar, find an event, and once that video has been uploaded to Vimeo, the recording, um, we, we post those links back in that event in Aspen. So it makes it a little easier for you to find it. And before we head off to you, Jenny, I just wanted to remind people about some training that's coming up. Um, the virtual fall workshops will be November 17th and 18th. And Registration will open, or um, I was hoping for October 1st, but now saying early October because I might need a couple extra days. And um, just trying to get uh, information in from my presenters so I can have a full program when we open up the registration. But it'll be early in October. And um, we do have plans. The, Mo the Montana Shared Catalog folks are going to be doing a session all focused on mobile applications. Um, we have a presenter that we've hired to, that's gotten really great reviews from some other libraries and other states. It's going to come in and talk about self-care, um, looking after ourselves at these difficult times. Uh, we have two librarians from Montana, Helena and, and uh, Billings, that are going to be doing a great program on, on setting up a youth programming youth programming activities at your libraries, even virtual activities. Um, and we've hired a librarian from the rural Adirondack region, southern Adirondack region in New York State to talk to do a session on community engagement for rural libraries. Even though she's from New York, the area that she serves is very Montana-like. It's mountainous, it's um, rural, it's very small, one, two-person libraries, so we're very excited to have her. And then I just um, hired Andrew Sanderbeck in the process of doing contract with him to do a session on de-escalation techniques for dealing with customers you know, maybe exhibiting some difficult behaviors. Not that we've heard anything about that recently, haha, -ha. but um, I think that'll be a very popular session. So I will announce the date that registration opens because all of these sessions will be limited. We want to try to keep fairly small classes because these are longer format trainings and we want everybody to be really engaged. So be sure to uh, get in soon and register as quickly as you can because I expect all of the classes will um, fill up. And I should mention that COVID, our COVID meetups are, are moving to a monthly basis. We're just not seeing quite the need to meet as often. So the next one will be in October. I don't have the date um, and it's not in Aspen yet. I look, just look, uh, but it'll be posted and Amelia will be sending out information on that. And then if you didn't know about it, the um, Association for Rural and Small Libraries is doing their conference virtually this year. They've reduced the price very reasonable. I think it's $50 for the whole conference. It's quite a long conference. Um, so you might look into that. It's, uh, we have a, we did offer 25 scholarships. It went pretty fast. And so there would be at least 25 Montana librarians attending. Actually, more like 32 because we have several of our staff attending. And we are planning to host, the MSO staff are planning to host a series of follow-up meetings to discuss some of those session topics. So shoot me an email if you want to know a little bit more information about that. And um, bringing some people into the meeting here. And then um, I, this is not on their website yet. I just checked. MLA's fall retreat, October 18th and 19th, save the date. I know that they've got um, 
uh, presentation proposals that they're looking at, so we should have information soon about what they're going to be covering there. So lots going on this fall, and today we're going to talk about funding priorities at the Montana State Library and some how we're spending some of our money, um, grant money. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Jenny. Thanks, Joe. Boy, what a great roundup of virtual learning opportunities. Looks like it's going to be a really exciting fall. So I'm excited about some of those chances to get together. We're going to, as Joe said, talk about some specific funding opportunities. Um, I wanted to make sure you were all aware of the efforts that State Library staff are supporting to help roll out our hotspot and device lending programs uh, supported by some of the um, Governor's Education uh, Investment Act funds coming from the, the CARES Act as well as some remaining Institute for Museum and Library Services funds that we have. We're really going to working hard to make sure that we're maximizing how we leverage those dollars to support all of you during this pandemic. So I've invited both Tracy Cook and Kara Orban from our staff to talk about those efforts. Uh, I'm also going to ask Kara if she wouldn't mind just sharing a, an update on our OCLC Group Services contract and progress made for our Montana Library to Go hosting contract. Before I turn things over to them, I did also want to share an update on the Public Library Standards Task Force work. Um, we've received your submissions for the FY20 Public Library Standards certification. Uh, staff have reviewed all those and I'm in the process of reviewing uh, those certifications from libraries where deferrals are necessary. Uh, and we'll plan to get all of those processed by the end of the month so that state aid and federation checks can start rolling out in October. Um, you all know that we were in the process of evaluating an update to the public library standards that are the standards that libraries have to meet in order to qualify for the state funding. And we were in a, a lengthy public comment period last spring when the pandemic hit. Uh, we've told you that in June we met with the Public Library Standards Task Force uh, about whether or not we should continue with the process that we were under in light of the pandemic, in light of, of uh, what we knew was changing about our library services um, and uh, what we might anticipate coming forward. Back in June the task force felt like we were really just beginning to grapple with what the pandemic was meaning for library services and we weren't in a position to reflect on what those changes might mean for future public library standards. So at their recommendation we and the State Library Commission put a pause on that process. The task force did meet again earlier this month and we've begun to pick the process up again um, but we do feel like we need to go back and revisit the revisions that the task force had developed and that were available last spring for public comment. Um, we've heard from a significant number of small libraries that uh, we need to do more to build a ladder or a scaffold to make sure the standards were more attainable for smaller libraries while still continuing to support continuous improvement in library development. So we're going to revisit the standards with that eye. Um, we also had just some really interesting discussions about the nature of resource sharing, uh, the opportunities for deeper collaboration, uh, some of which may be coming out of the collaboration we've seen as a result of the pandemic around virtual programming and those kinds of services. And so we're currently reflecting on thoughts around what it might be like to have some advanced standards that are really statewide library standards that we, we necessarily need to come together in order to achieve. We don't really know what that looks like yet. I think it's an exciting opportunity. It's something we'll be exploring with staff and further on with the task force this fall and later into the winter. 
We hope at this point that we might be ready to take a revised set of draft standards to the commission in December at their December meeting. And then from there, we would continue to um, follow the process we had outlined with a couple of different kinds of public comment processes, starting that public comment process over. This will, of course, necessarily continue to push back the timeline that we had set for ourselves, which ultimately concluded with adoption and standards in around FY22. We know at a minimum that will be pushed back at least a year, potentially longer, depending on how long this process takes. I don't feel like we need to be in a rush to accomplish this revision. I, I think it's much more important for us to be really thoughtful and take the time to get the necessary feedback from people so you all feel comfortable with the standards. Again, our goals for the standards are to make sure that they reflect really 21st century library services, that they drive library services in such a way that we can achieve the State Library Commission's resolution to provide access to information services sufficient to all Montanans' needs, that the standards really reflect user needs and a user point of view, and that they're designed in such a way that we can really measure the impact that we're having for our users. So I'm excited to continue that process, continue good dialogue with all of you, but wanted you to be aware that while continuing, uh, that process will be continuing at a slower pace. Any questions about the standards? All right, I'm gonna ask Tracy to go first and talk about our, our gear funds and our hotspot and device lending program. And, and Tracy, if there's anything else related to our COVID spending that you wanna highlight, please feel free. Thanks, Jenny. And Jill, I don't know if you wanna make me the presenter. I don't have a ton of visuals, but I do have a couple that I think might help for people to see. Um, I I'm think, happy to just. I think that's a splendid idea. Let me just get a few people admitted here and I will do that. Hold on. Let me make this all. Your co host. Where are you? Go ahead and start and I'll, I'll catch up to you. I'll get it. Okay. And so for those of you who are kind of on, Line. I'm going to go ahead and just pop the links in the to the chat so that you can see um, what I am talking about. So the first link that I popped into the chat was actually our page that we've created to kind of support the Montana State Library Hotspot Lending Program. I, I know many of you on the call are actually involved in this project. And you should be able to share now. And so I hope that you will feel comfortable chiming in um, as I go through this. If you aren't aware of it, a hotspot is basically a, a very small device that can kind of fit in the palm of your hand that uses a cellular network to provide people with access to the internet. And when COVID first happened, um, many libraries around the state kind of made it clear that they were very, very worried about their patrons who had no access to the internet. It was pretty obvious how critically important that was. And we had heard of other uh, libraries in Montana and around the nation checking out these hotspots. So we took some of our LSTA 19 money that was freed up because of things we couldn't do due to COVID-19. And we began to offer hotspots uh, to libraries, primarily public libraries around Montana um, in order for them to be able to either circulate those, check them out to their patrons, or even uh, deposit them at a local business so that people could use them at various points around the community. And the way this program works is the devices, we were able to work with T-Mobile and Verizon, and they offered us the devices for free, and then the state library is paying for the data plan. So we rolled those out and heard from many librarians who were very excited about it and the possibility of it that 
it was helping. However, there was a need for more hotspots and devices so that patrons could actually check out both a hotspot and some kind of device that they could use to do their schoolwork or to apply for a job or whatever it was that the patron was doing at home. And so uh, Jenny asked me to uh, prepare a letter for the governor's emergency relief funds to apply for funding for us to expand this program to be able to offer hotspots to public libraries, tribal college libraries, and academic libraries, and to be able to offer devices to public libraries. And the governor awarded us $500,000 to expand this program. And so with that, kind of after about July 1, we started rolling these out. And I'm just gonna show this map, which gives you a sense of who is participating in the project. And as of right now, there are 77 libraries participating. The red dots are public libraries. The green dots are tribal college libraries and the blue dots are the academic libraries that are involved in this program. And so at this point in time, every hotspot has been spoken for and the devices are also spoken for. Um, many more libraries joined in round two, as we called it. And we don't really have an opportunity to offer this or open it up to anyone at this point. However, we do think that it's possible that we will be able to redistribute some of the hotspots. And what I mean by that is now that we've been running this program since May, some people find they can't keep the hotspots on their shelf and others find that they don't meet, need as many hotspots as they have. And so we are going to um, come back, go back to the libraries and just kind of check in with them and make sure that um, if they don't need the hotspots, we can redistribute them to other libraries who want to participate. And yeah, Heather, I think that I am missing some libraries in the, um, the project. I kind of realized that when I was going in here. So Forsyth is a part of this project. Um, Phillips County Library, I believe, is as well. I was basically doing this yesterday afternoon and things were being updated in a pretty regular way. So I should have said this is a draft. At this point in time, Kind of some of the things we've learned with this particular project is first of all that T-Mobile's coverage might not be as fantastic as we hoped. Um, we did, we've had a few libraries ask about AT&T or local ISPs providing support and Jenny followed up on that and was able to actually get assistance for the libraries up in the northeastern corner of Montana. AT&T sadly could not offer us a plan that was affordable. Um, so I think that's one thing we all know and are having confirmed is that uh, cell connections aren't, the, they aren't equal everywhere in Montana. The other thing I think we've found interesting is how many people don't know what hotspot means. And so during the Wednesday webinar where we talked about all about mobile hotspots, Imagine If mentioned that they stopped using that terminology and just said, check out the internet to take it home or be able to use the internet at home. And so I think the next phases of this project are really about marketing it and getting the word out to people. And then also, um, of course, having kits uh, to collect, co to connect devices to mobile hotspots. So at, at this point, the hotspots are going out to the libraries and the devices, um, we are setting them up, trying to create cheat sheets. The iPads should be arriving here soon. There's a slight delay on the HP Pros, which is a tablet-like device. And so that's probably gonna be more like early November. And that's something I know Joe and Hanor were talking about at the beginning of this webinar. Many vendors are seeing a lot of delays. And so we can't get things as quickly. So is there anything you would add, Jenny? Anything that I forgot to mention about this project? Just a huge shout out to Nemont. They've been a great partner. Um, and I want to clarify, there was a question that came up in the Golden Plains Federation about when the funding for the data plans ends, 
from the state library and when libraries will have a chance to decide if they want to continue offering the hotspots on their own. I had thought it was the end of June, but it might be September next year. Yes, um, John recrunched the numbers and we are able to pay through September. Great. So, Fantastic. yes, yep. Yeah, it is wonderful. Any questions for me on this? Yes, Beth, that is correct. September 2021 is what, mm -hmm. yeah. And so is there any uh, plan or effort to try to extend beyond that date for covering data plans or do libraries start to need to plan now for taking over that cost next September? At this point, we don't have any funding identified to continue the services. That, of course, could change, especially if Congress comes up with some additional stimulus packages. Uh, it would likely have to come in that kind of form. So. Uh, if pressed right now, I would say that September 2021 is when libraries should anticipate transitioning. Um, that could change, but I think libraries should plan on that. So is that September 1st or the end of September? That is actually something I want to verify with John, but his spreadsheet that he shared with me says September 30th. 2021. So that would be the entire month. Any other questions on that? I just had one other thing I wanted to talk about and then I was going to uh, turn it over to Kara. I'm not seeing anything come in the chat box, a little bit of discussion there. And of course, you all are welcome to unmute your microphones and just jump in. So the other uh, thing we did with the LSTA 19 funding, actually we did uh, three or four different things. Most of them related to electronic resources because it was pretty clear with COVID-19 that we needed to really ensure that people had access to different resources. And so I did want to put in a plug for Read Squared. This is an online application, and it's not just for summer reading. Um, some of you may have heard of it through Amelia Kim, who kind of administers this program. It, it can be used any time of year. There are different missions um, that you can choose to do with your young patrons and their families to make reading fun and to encourage literacy and just exposure to books. And Amelia would be a great one for talking about this program and helping you get set up if you haven't already. She also has um, a community forum. I don't know if any of you have seen this, but she uses Zoho. And so librarians uh, can go back and forth about the different ways that they've used it. And so you can see some of the great ideas that people have had about this program and their experiences using it. And I noticed that in particular, um, Michelle, the director in the Ronan Library District and the Billings Public Library have used some of those mission driven uh, reading online reading programs to kind of encourage kids and families to have fun with reading and to continue to expose kids to books. So this could be an option for you, especially since COVID-19 is kind of lingering. You know, I know this came quickly and you might not have had the kind of headspace to sign up at the beginning of summer. However, if you're interested, and especially with winter coming, you might want to check this out and get in touch with Amelia to sign up for Read Squared because it is something that I think many of the librarians have discovered is pretty fun and their patrons really love it as well. So with that, I will turn it over to Kara to talk about the rest of the LSTA 19 funding and the OCLC and Montana Library to Go contract. All right, I do not have anything to show on the screen necessarily. So Joe, if you want to take that back over, that's fine. Hi everyone, this is Kara. And I wanted to share a couple of quick contract 
updates with you and then share some exciting news about what we're doing with our remaining LSDA funds. So as Jenny mentioned earlier, we had a couple of contracts that were set to expire this past fiscal year at the end of June. And so going back about a year, we started the process of looking into our procurement options for those contracts. Those two contracts are the OCLC group services contract and the overdrive contract, which serves the Montana library to go consortium. So the first one I'll talk about is OCLC. And we have over 200 libraries enrolled in this contract, which provides access to online and client-based cataloging and interlibrary loan tools for library staff, which many of you participate in. Our um, OCLC contract has been in place for many years and has always, to my knowledge, been what we call a sole source contract, meaning that our state procurement bureau considers OCLC to be the only company that is able to provide this particular suite of services all together in one bundle. And that has also included the um, content DM software that we use for the Montana Memory Project. That allows us to renew that contract without having to make it a competitive process, which is more labor intensive. But this past year, we, we did decide to open a process called a request for information, which is a way for us to be able to explore other vendor options on the market without committing to a contract. And we started that last fall because we wanted to learn what other companies provide cataloging and interlibrary loan services. And we had an RFI committee composed of group services members uh, and also MMP, Montana Memory Project uh, contributors so that we could look at all of those different services and what was available. Uh, there were several responses for the MMP, but we did not receive any responses from companies that can provide cataloging or interlibrary loan. Although we are aware that there are other companies that have developed these services in recent years, but we did not receive any information from them through this process. So, we decided to forego the RFP process, the, con the formal contract competitive process for cataloging and interlibrary loan and split that out from the MMP contract. So um, Jennifer Burnell is the project director for MMP and she proceeded with an RFP process for those services while we decided to sign a sole, sole source contract renewal with OCLC for another year for cataloging and interlibrary loan. We did take this opportunity to review those services and look at what changes we might be able to make to our subscription levels because we know that libraries are sharing resources and making them discoverable in, in ways that are different from what we were doing 10 years ago when this contract was last updated. So we wanted to make sure that our contract investment matches our current needs. And in reviewing our choices, we realized that there's a lot more nuance in the cataloging subscription based on the needs within the shared catalog, the needs among uh, our power users who do a lot of original cataloging, both in and outside of the shared catalog, and even original cataloging needs among libraries of all sizes. So we realized we didn't really have enough data to make an informed uh, profound shift in that subscription. So we'd not change anything about the cataloging subscription for this year. We did make a change to interlibrary loan to centralize the ILL request process for about half of the subscribed libraries that rarely or never use ILL because our group services contract is bundled. Everyone gets enrolled in ILL, but certainly not everyone needs unlimited access. And those libraries that never use it, we're not seeing a great value from that, um, that level of access. So by changing this, it reduces the cost of our contract so those libraries are not overpaying for that service. And we're regarding this as a pilot for this year to see whether the centralized model works 
for those libraries and whether it turns out to be more work for us as a centralized service than we we're able to absorb. Uh, and so those libraries may see a change in their service in how they request items, but um, for everyone else, you should not see any changes and you will not see a change in the way that those libraries request items. They'll just be coming through a centralized portal. So as I said, our catalog contract did not change. Uh, our, our Montana Shared Catalog Content Management Committee was asked to review some statistics about our cataloging use of various services and how we um, bring records into the shared catalog. And we're getting some clarification on those stats so that they can help us to understand exactly what kind of workflows are, are happening and what services we need to, to be sure to to sustain or and where we might be able to make changes, at least within that group. So we may be able to revisit the cataloging subscription next year and see if we can uh, make adjustments that would make that uh, more cost effective for us and for our libraries. So that was a lot about OCLC. And of course, if you have questions, feel free to put them in chat or I'll, um, or interrupt me if you like. So I was going to briefly talk about the Montana Library to Go contract, which has been a rather more involved process because we did proceed to RFP for that contract. So we went through the request for information as we did with OCLC, but we anticipated we would get a lot of responses and we did. We got actually six responses for the Montana Library to Go contract and um, this is for downloadable and streaming ebooks and audiobooks and other e content, but primarily the ebooks and audiobooks is our core of that service. And there have been a lot more options available in recent years. So, um, different service models that we were interested to learn more about. Ultimately, we went to RFP, so the competitive process to award a contract this spring and received six responses again. We scored those and we had three top offerers, Overdrive, which is our current service provider, uh, Baker and Taylor, which has a, pro a product called Access 360, and Biblioteca, which has a product called Cloud Library. And we went through the RFP and product demos and there was there were some issues with the way that the cost proposal was scored that I won't go into the weeds on that but we had some issues that procurement was not comfortable awarding the contract so we went out for RFP again in um, I believe we revised that in May. We had to be able to write the cost proposal in a, in a way that could be fairly and equitably or equally scored across vendors. And some vendors have different licensing models or hosting fee models. So we wanted to make that as apples to apples as we possibly could. So we revised that section and sent it out again. And ultimately, um, the pieces that we were looking at were certainly user experience, the app, uh, experience for our our patrons as well as the administrative model do we have a robust set of tools that allow our volunteer selection team to adeptly work together and uh, build carts and automate what processes we can to fill holds and um, things like that those were very important in the scoring process and also what kind of reporting tools were available and what kind of support was available to our participating libraries. So all those factors went into the scoring. And ultimately we have signed a contract with OverDrive for this year. I would say that the scoring was pretty close, but OverDrive had more of an advantage on particularly the administrative tools that the selection team relies on. And everybody seemed to like the, the Libby app very well. So we, we are, Moving forward with those negotiations for that contract. So 
that was a lot about procurement. <laughs> um, so I'm going to now move on to some really fun news about our remaining LSTA. And this is kind of a segue from Montana Library to go into our school libraries because we have been able to apply some remaining LSTA funds to help school libraries to adjust to these extraordinary circumstances they are facing this year by offering them enrollment for this academic year in the Montana Schools eBooks program, which is kind of a, an analog to the Montana Library to Go. Both of these are uh, services provided by OverDrive. They have a shared platform. The libraries log in and then they share content. And so this is a school specific collection which offers age appropriate reading level appropriate downloadable and streaming ebooks and audiobooks to students at those subscribing schools. There are currently about, I believe, 80 members enrolled in that group. This is not a contract that the state library administers, but is independent. And uh, we know that many of students are continuing to learn remotely, library instruction, physical checkouts may be limited. We had heard that some libraries have even been repurposed as classrooms. And so just as the public libraries have relied on additional e-resources to help fill in some of their service gaps that they may not be able to address because of the pandemic, we wanted to extend that opportunity to school libraries. And to that end, we received inquiries from 36 school districts from across the state and are going to be working with OverDrive to enroll these schools in the next couple of weeks using those one-time only monies. We will also have a balance to apply to the content credit for that collection so that those schools that were already enrolled will be able to receive some extra value from that investment in their subscription for this academic year. So that is I had to share for those contracts. And Connie asks, can homeschool families access? I don't know if they are able to access the school uh, collection. I think that is probably a policy that is set by the school district, whether or not they will give a card to a homeschooling family. But that's a good question. Thanks, Kara. Jenny, anything else you want to add? We're not seeing, a, let's see, any questions in the chat box, comments? Lots of great work from staff. Any questions from anybody? Before we wrap up, I did want to let you know that the next meeting of the State Library Commission is going to be online via Zoom at 9.30 on October 14th. The agenda for that meeting will be posted next week and some of the agenda items include more updates like we've had today, uh, the federation reporting that happens at the October commission meetings. We're going to roll out a great new reporting dashboard for federation members and the commission at that meeting. So I'm really excited about that. And Joe's going to give the commission an overview of the great work libraries have been doing to support the 2020 census. Don't forget, it's not too late to be counted. Week, yes, next week. And um, we do have a number of libraries that are planning activities and events, but you do not need to plan an activity or an event. I know that some libraries can't do that, but if you do have um, internet access at your library in one way or another, even if that's Wi-Fi from the parking lot. I hope that you will drop me a quick email and I'll send you the link to our um, survey, real quick survey to collect that information from you so that we can get you on our dashboard next week. There's a lot of press going out from the Department of Commerce. We're partnering with them um, to, to get some press out. You may have noticed there's just a ton going on with the census in the last final 13 days to try to inch Montana up because we are 
near the bottom of the list in terms of uh, the undercount. We're really doing poorly in Montana um, for a lot of reasons. It's not one single reason, but there's great concern that we're going to be underfunded for the next 10 years based on the numbers that we have. So any little, any effort you can make in that regard, post to your personal social media or um, hopefully you are posting to your, to your library social media to kind of encourage people to self-report. That is very helpful. And don't forget that the census counts have a direct impact on your state aid because the, the dollar amount is determined on a per capita amount tied to that official census count for the state of Montana. Yeah, the estimate is um, that we lose $2,000 per person per year for the next 10 years. We're locked into those numbers for 10 years, so if we're undercounted, it impacts our, our revenue for the next decade. And not to mention, you know, we have a good chance of picking up a representative in the House, and the Federal um, Congress and the House of Representatives, and that won't happen if we're severely undercounted as well. So. Do what you can. I really, I mean, I appreciate it, and I know Jenny does. And I, and I will say that Montana, and Montana libraries are certainly getting our fair share of, of recognition for the efforts that we are putting in. So that's a good thing to see too. I mean, I hope you all saw the great story on CBS Evening News um, last last Saturday. That was really nice, and. Um, the press release going out this weekend has a very nice quote that I sent around to Wired from our lieutenant governor as well, acknowledging the work of libraries. So you guys are doing great work. And people are noticing, so that's good. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording unless you have anything else, Jenny? Oh, thanks for joining us, everyone.